King of Podcasts Radio Network proudly presents the Broadcasters Podcast. Here is the King of Podcasts. I wouldn't normally go ahead and take from ChatGPT to go ahead and start off my show, but you know what? When I asked for it to write me a little ditty on my program topic for tonight, it did a pretty good job. I want to take some of what was written here and kind of go with it. So it talks about, now there's three headlines that I'm going to be featuring on the program that start things off that really kind of just lay across where social media, specifically TikTok, and also streaming. Let's make streaming as well, you know, in the same vein, Spotify and Apple podcast or Spotify and iTunes for that matter. And how much you're affecting corporate media, corporate music, all of it. It's amazing how much damage is doing because the corporate media model always had control of physical units of physical content, content that they could sell content. They could pass along trade, whatever they wanted. When all went digital, they lost control and they've lost control ever since. And the platforms where people might watch content, They've also gone by the wayside. Traditional, linear, controlled models. Internet took it away. <coughs> when television no longer is effective. Network TV. When cable is no longer effective. When radio is no longer effective. When the way you listen to music through a device. Right? CD, cassette, vinyl, all of it rendered useless because of the wonderful world of the digital disruption, which of course I talk about in this program regularly, constant basis. And here we are once again. So let me take what Chad GBD actually wrote. So those headlines that we have right now, headlines include Don't expect social media to save the news industry. Business Times. How the media industry keeps losing the future. New York Times. Record label layoffs hit radio promotion staffs. Why is happening? Billboard. It's accompanying the headaches that corporate media and music labels are all dealing with right now. But I will say that Chad TPT didn't get everything exactly right on this. Corporate media giants with their legacy newspapers, TV networks, and radio stations have long been the primary sources of news and information. Upholding journalistic ethics and editorial integrity, they served as the gatekeepers of public discourse. Yeah, you could probably write it that way, but they're not necessarily in a good way anymore because they might have gatekeeped all of our media, our news, our music, and how we were able to consume what the mainstream culture was consumed of. But that's a pretty interesting way of putting it gatekeeping. And as long as they were able to go and be gatekeepers, then everything was fine in the world. But the digital disruption got rid of the gatekeeping because it became another realm, another universe that people could go to for entertainment, for music, for all their content. So rendering corporate media useless. And it's a fascinating thing. Fascinating. To go through this now, as I record this program, roughly five and a half years later, <clears throat> and it doesn't get old for me, it doesn't get, I don't get tired of it, I'll tell you that. And then some of the actions being done by corporate media to try to keep themselves together, what they have to go and do in true corporate fashion, make massive layoffs, cuts, micromanage your content, spend less on the quality then try to create more quantity. It's all these things that are just completely wrong. Now, according to the story here from ChatGPT, it says, well, social media platforms prioritize engagement metrics. They often amplify sensationalist or misleading content, undermining the credibility of traditional journalism. Okay, they they try to cut this out here, but it's like, it's all news. It's all content. We don't need anybody to be gatekeeping anything. Okay, we don't need gatekeepers. If you want to be able to control the narrative of what people should be listening to and what would be important, fine. 
but don't gatekeep. No one gets to keep the gate. No one gets to go and hold on to the gate and control what's out there. You want to make points of how people can absorb it? Okay, fine. But you don't get the gatekeep. And that was allowed for a long time because there was no other way to do it. But now the internet took that all away. Now, I'm mostly talking about the news side, but there's much more. The content altogether is a change for everything. But like I said, there's a lot of things when it comes to news, television, entertainment, music, all that encompasses all here and changes. And that's the part where people are really not happy about or comfortable with. News media is the first part that's being considered. We'll talk about that according to New York Times. (laughs) This is from a few weeks ago, by the way, but still holds a part to talk about here. Said every day brings bad news. It's recently formed digital enterprises, sometimes venerable publications whose history stretches far back more than a century. Cutbacks being put, and these are ones we haven't talked about yet, with Law 360, The Intercept. Now this, Linghoff half their staff, and Gadget, Vice Media, Sports Illustrated, LA Times, Washington Post, eliminating hundreds of journalists between them. One out of five, one out of four newspapers that existed in 2005 no longer does. And there's signs that the whole concept of news is fading. As for the get the news, nearly as many respondents to a Gallup poll said social media, as mentioned newspapers and magazines. Now, I talked to a newspaper editor that was a longtime media executive pushing a reassuring vision of the future of newspapers and that the concept of news is now failing, fading now and is very not very optimistic about the survival of the majority of newspapers in the United States. Yeah. Which, you know, that's been going on for a while now. And they talk about the, the lack of reliable new local reporting. There is reporting. It's just not gatekeeps anymore. Because if it's not coming from a three-letter network or a local news station, and it's coming from somebody on a TikTok feed or an Instagram feed or an X feed, yeah, that's their problem. They don't like that kind of coverage. They don't want to have people just feel they're going to be, you know, citizen journalists out there and write stories or put video out there and let people see what's going on around them because it's all changed everything. That's the part New York Times don't like about that. So I was going to bring up the Business Times because of the fact they talk about where Australia tried to set up an arrangement in 2021 to have Meta, social media giant Meta for Facebook and Instagram, have them pay for news content on their plat- for their platforms. It was a lifeline for struggling local publishers, a publishing code. And it was seen as a way to even out the power imbalance between modest sized news businesses and the U.S. huge based social media giants that sucked away advertising revenue from U.S. news outlets or from news outlets in general. Then Canada tried to do the same thing and they had did it for a year. And Meta went into agreements with news publishers, collectors, and paid a fee for the content. But that period of relief is going to go to an end. So the publishing codes that everybody thought was going to be the answer for all these major corporate companies to go and hold on to, you know, they thought they were going to be able to get social media to go and pay. You know, the news outlets want to be able to do that. They want to have what's called the news media bargaining code, which is the payoff. Just make it like that. This is a story back from March from a financial review of Australia. And they mentioned a point that was a secret deal between Facebook and Network 10, including onerous requirements for the broadcaster to share some 18,000 videos to Facebook and Instagram and threats to tear up the $14 million contract of the technology giant was forced to negotiate by the government. And Meta signed deals with the country's largest media groups to avoid being due so under the government's news bargaining news media bargaining code. Details were never published, by the way. But the Australian Financial Review obtained two summaries of agreements signed between 10, owned by media giant Paramount, and Facebook. And Meta then would say they were no longer going to pay for news, setting up a stylus with publishers and the Albanese governor, government. excuse me. So Meta pulling out of news contracts would deal a blow to media companies, as some of these companies would lose between 5 and 9% of their net profit if the deals don't continue which is probably what they were making in profit from what they were doing to be able to blackmail Meta to pay for their news. 
for not getting for taking supposedly their advertising away. Fa the terms of Facebook's contract with Ten are revealing because they demonstrate how much value the social media site puts on videos. Facebook sought to recoup some of its cash by putting ads around Ten's videos, and then reported their best quarter ever in Australia. Meta's Australian managing director said that videos booming on Facebook and Instagram. So the deals in 2021, we're learning about that. First contract was June 15, 2021. And that the deal was for $2.75 billion plus GST, which is what that is, per annum for the three years that content is posted. And once Facebook has recouped the fee expenditure and net revenue, that were 10 would be entitled to a 55% share of any additional net advertising revenue. Those funds were paid monthly in lump sums of $229,166,000. Wait, $229,000, 166. Yeah, $229,166. And the deal was approved by six people, including Paramount's chief content officer, Beverly McGarvey, and their COO, Jared Villani. Second contract was with 10 in Facebook Ireland for $400,000 a year, paid in increments of $32,333 monthly. And that was paid between July 2021 and June 2024. An agreement to non-monetize articles created by the project on the Facebook News Surface platform via content feed from 10 Play. And so, yeah, Facebook was willing to go and buy for videos to use them on the platform and put advertising around them. But they were paying these news channels for their content. In Canada, they responded to a similar law. Ending if Facebook, Instagram, or WhatsApp were designated under the News Media Bargaining Code, a poison pill clause. Or if any law prevented Facebook from pulling news off its feeds. And designating Meta would force it to negotiate with media companies a process overseen by an independent arbitrator. Google's confirmed they will negotiate new deals with the media, but the decision by Meta to withdraw deals is a heavy blow to companies that have been grappling with a deepening advertising crunch. So last year, New Zealand was left with one commercial TV newsroom after Warner Brothers Discovery decided to close News Hub, laying off 200 plus people. And publishers now compete with the likes of Netflix, Uber, and Amazon to sell ads to targeted audiences. <laughs> The reason they're going after new, after Facebook or Facebook doesn't want to pay anymore is they're saying that the number of people using Facebook news in Australia and the U.S. has declined by over 80% this year, last year. We know that people don't come to Facebook for news and political content. So if they're not going to get that, they're not going to bother doing anything about it. We basically referred to it was a $70 million Australian lifeline to keep these news operations afloat. Why is it on Facebook to do anything about that? And all these separate deals as well. Like, that's the whole thing, too. You know, Facebook just isn't going to be a part of that game. And I get it. TikTok is now going through the same kind of deal right now because they're going through a bargaining with Universal Music. And so far, nobody's coming to the table. But Universal Music is in the same boat as these news corporations. Because they're losing money hand and foot. And they can't keep getting more money off of their artists when they've you know, decided to embed it into their merchandise and their concert sales. Like they're trying to take, still take as much as they can from the artist and, you know, hang, dangling over as a carrot their, their publishing rights, you know, their catalogs to get them back to them after the fact. It's this kind of behavior now that's really hurting media in general because corporate doesn't want to play nice corporate news media they want to have a news media bargaining code they try to instill that right now in the u.s it's not going to pass because social media is not going to play that game and they shouldn't tiktok hey if the universal music doesn't want to play ball and all these other companies want to come out there and do something with it fine hey it's on universal music their loss they want to go play with Spotify? No, go right ahead. How much are they going to make? 
They're worried about what everybody they can get without logically thinking about what they're doing when they're trying to get the money. I've said this already a few times this in the last few weeks. You want to go after Google because YouTube is playing full videos of your songs? Okay. Want to go after Spotify and iTunes because you're getting full songs being played? Absolutely. YouTube, you're getting 30 seconds to a minute. You're teasing music on there. Why do you want so many royalties off of them? And if you're only getting 1% of your profits off of them, then why bother? Why is this important to go and just alienate all your artists now as a result? Because that's who's hurting from it. It's not the audience. It's not the audience. And what happens with the media because they do this here? Because they get all upset and butthurt over this? Well... Then the record labels start laying people off. We talked about that a couple weeks ago as well. I'll get to more about the music in a moment. I'll get more into the music in a moment, but let's take a opinion piece from the LA Times. Last June, you know, state of California tried to do the same thing. The California Journalism Preservation Act, requiring social media companies to pay usage fee for the publishers for the news content that the platforms benefit from. Publishers would have to spend at least 70% of the fees they receive on journalists or support staff. Money would come out of platforms, advertising revenue, and the amount would be determined by arbitration. California wanted to emulate Australia's news media bargaining code. Developed by the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission. And Canada's equivalent wanted to do the same thing. Governments in Britain, Brazil, Indonesia, New Zealand, South Africa, and Switzerland all considering similar laws. Because they're just going to play this power trip to try to make their money back. Because they can't do it on their own. They're failing. Many journalism, journalism outlets are in crisis with advertising revenue, what plummeting while Google and Meta use their news content to attract users, add dollars without paying for it. And think about this. All these companies, publicly traded, are they replenishing their staffs back because of what they're doing here? No. Like, are they doing anything to bring back investigative reporting, bring back better content? No. So Australia has done this for several years, we know. Estimated payout to Australian publishers, well over $140 million each year to small and large media organizations. Google's formed commercial arrangements with virtually all qualifying media outlets, Meta's completed deals with about 85% of Australian journalists. And of course, the Treasury Department of Australia says the news bargaining code was a success. Hundreds of new jobs have been created, with employment data showing a 46% increase in job ads for at journalists. But how many of those are like full paying jobs? How many of those are, you know, freelancers? Let's talk about that. The Guardian Australia added 50 journalists, bringing its newsroom to 150 people. Journalism professors say that more of their students are being hired and some job vacancies are going unfilled. Opponents argue that most of the money would go to the largest media outlets. And of course, true says the organizations employ the most journalists and produce the most news used by Google and Meta. But small media groups have benefited enormously from the law, they said. Country Press Australia has 160 very small publications, has been able to negotiate excellent deals for its members with both Google and Meta, which will under, help underwrite their prosperity. And another argument that's put forward is that Google and Meta do not always advertise against media content. Media content attracts users to the platforms where they can see advertisements. Google search would be far less if it did not offer users access to media content, ranging from the best new movies to court cases about to COVID-19. By showing the headline and a few new lines of news in Google search, Google skims off the most valuable part of the news without sharing the monetary benefits with the news outlets. And you think this is all going to make a change? Let me tell you something. If Google ever decides to go ahead and do their own thing when it comes to news content, to the point they say, well, we're just going to make it citizen-wide, we're going to create a platform for all the news to be gathered and curated and placed in one place. They decide to go ahead and rewrite the journalism game. If Google and Meta decided to do that, you're done. Traditional media is over. You are playing with fire by doing this to these people. You don't realize what you're doing. 
I remember it's for the most part big media companies. Opposed to the law have argued that it can benefit media organizations that traffic and misinformation or biased reporting, but laws should not choose one outlet over another. Australia has four large media companies, many medium-sized companies, and a huge number of small media outlets. They all benefited with deals from Google's, and nearly all benefited from meta deals. Journalism as a whole was a winner. Yeah, but it's the winner is journalism held by gatekeepers. Because I'm sure there's a lot of stories they're not allowed to be able to do. So this story, they said that the Preservation Act would have been a vital piece of legislation that would keep journalism sustainable. And by the way, the person that wrote this story is an Australian National University chairperson, an Australian journalism person over there. So California lawmakers this year, they're considering the act. And legislation has been introduced in in Congress, but no traction yet. It passed the California State Assembly last July with broad bipartisan support. Backers hope that some modifications, it could become law later this year. But the bill has run to the vocal opposition because Big Tech said this. Hey, Meta, they'll pull news from Facebook and Instagram in California if it becomes law. When Canada tried to pull the same number, they did it. Without delay. Carry through. But then there's also thoughts here from some journalists and media experts that the bill could be currently crafted, could result in a payment scheme that can encourage, encourage high volume clickbait and disproportionately benefit larger newsrooms while doing little to help smaller ones. Exactly. See, this can all be corrupted. Do we all understand that? You want the federal government to control, basically go up and force the hand of Google and Meta to be publishers and make them pay. There's a story that's also very similar that that, that takes to this when it comes to net neutrality regulations. That's not going to be considered once again. SEC is going to be voting on that again. A proposal on net neutrality that would bring back a national standard for broadband reliability because security and consumer protection. Because remember, there's a whole lot of talk about the but net neutrality and the distinction between a utility and a publisher and what could happen as a result of that. So keep that in mind too, if that ever comes to, to light. The bottom line is that we do not need government to control who funds what. These are private companies. Well, they might be publicly traded as well, but still they're in business they need to figure out how to make money on their business. Just because social media is making a whole lot more money off of it and they happen to still be exposing your content, okay, hey, I don't think it's going to hurt Meta at all if they decide to go and take news off their platform because it doesn't matter. They can throw that away and just go on and do something else. They can find other content they can do. They have enough user-generated content anyway. Same thing with TikTok. And Google gets to do the same thing as well. I mean, you're doing this as a bullying tactic. That's what the news media is trying to do, is a bullying tactic to try to control and get social media to go and pay. Because they can't make the money themselves. It's on them. It's on them to figure their own problem out. And on top of that, they don't do anything to rectify the situation in those outfits. If you put money back into these newspapers, into these publications, you do something more with digital, and you find a better way to get your content out there, you can still be viable outlets, okay? There's more than enough going on out there. Listen, when I look through my Google News Feed or other places, yeah, you know, it would be nice to go and watch other feeds or whatever stories I want to look at. But every time I look at a Palm Beach Post ad, I'm getting a news of a big fat paywall. And by the way, any story that we're going to, we're not just getting the easy peasy going right in and looking at the articles. No, you guys throw on and boatload ads and pop-ups and subscribe this, subscribe that stuff all over the place. 
And maybe you give the people like a Chrome, like, oh, here's an article or two for free. And you got to sign up with your email. So you can get blasted with, you know, subscription emails all the time. You're complicit. It's on you because you want to go and be able to do that. Why are you getting upset with us? You're taking it out on the users. You're taking it out on the readers. Not our fault. Same thing with the websites for all these news outlets. For TV, cable, local TV, whatever it is, you got ads all over the place. You get your own pop-ups up there too, right? All that. And what do you want us to do? Why should we be so worried about that? Not our problem. But everyone wants to make it a problem. Not our fault. It's stupid like that. It really is. But I don't think that kind of thing happening. But that's that's the side of news. Now what about music? A couple of things coming out from the music side, music business worldwide, talks about changes to Spotify's royalty model, including the 1,000 annual streams royalty policy. Now live. The way that Spotify is going to calculate recorded royalties. Hoping to add, drive an additional $1 billion in revenue towards emerging and professional artists over the next five years. That's the plan on this. So now the policies are officially live. They're going to further deter artificial streaming, better distribute small payments that aren't reaching artists, and rein in those attempting to gain the system of noise. So Spotify's policy to better distribute small payments that aren't reaching artists sees introduction of a minimum threshold for streams before any track starts generating royalties. That means the practice is that tracks must have reached a threshold of at least 1,000 streams in the previous 12 months to be included in the recorded music royalty pool calculation. Also, the minimum number of unique listeners required for a track to become eligible for royalties as well. Ensuring the sisters, users came to the system by streaming the track hundreds of times in order to qualify. And Spotify won't share the number of unique listeners required by, to become eligible for royalties to prevent third, further manipulation by ad, bad actors. They're also going to try to deter artificial streaming, and they will charge labels and distributors per track when flagrant artificial streaming is detected on their content. And they're also going to try to prevent bad actors from giving the system with noise, increasing the minimum track length of functional noise recordings to two minutes in order to be, able, be eligible to generate royalties on the platform. Functional genres include white noise, nature sounds, machine noises, sound effects, non-spoken ASMR, and silence recordings. TikTok is also into the talk as well, because we're hearing a lot of things when it comes to TikTok, that Europeans trade association for indie labels, Impala. They're signing with Universal Music about their dispute with TikTok over fees for licensing music on the social media platform. And Impala is calling on streaming services that recently made changes to the royalty payoffs to address what's called the negative consequences of those changes. Spotify and Deezer moving to an artist-centric model. Apple changing payoffs that reward music available in spatial audio. And Apollo's chair of streaming revenue group, Mark Kitkat, says there's an urgent need to secure fair revenues. We also reject arguments equating the use of music on TikTok to promotion. There's a huge value gap that must be addressed, but beyond that, an exciting opportunity to explore new ways of generating and sharing revenues. And Apollo says there's a need for services like TikTok to collaborate with the independent music community to achieve fair licensing terms. But no matter what, they're trying to determine what the value is of partial music. And yes, TikTok has a promotion, but and how much you want to go and charge them for promoting your content. That's all. We see a lot of movie studios putting their content up there, and I don't see them trying to get any royalties back on those movies, on those movie trailers. Just saying. Same thing here. They're trailers. It's promotional material. They're not playing the actual records. So how can you do that? We've talked about radio for a long time when it comes to the lack of radio promotion. Because it is much easier for the record label to go ahead and promote through TikTok or YouTube or Instagram or whatever to promote their artists because they know that people are listening and watching there. As a result, radio is no longer in the mix. And we've seen a constant erosion 
of people working on radio promotion. And Steve Knopper at Billboard makes a story about this. Inside the revolution of record label radio staffs as layoffs hit promotions departments hard. So they bring up the story about, you know, some artists that will still go to radio to get their music played. Paramore had a new single, This Is Why, back in September 2022. Ron Poor and his Atlantic Radio radio promotions team called Alternative Rock program directors for months to convince them to add the new song to playlists. The song hit number one on the Alternative Airplay chart of Billboard, February 2023. And Poor says, quote, you work that record for weeks and weeks and weeks, and all of a sudden it starts showing up with the research. It's an example of a classic record label promo story. An experienced major label staff working radio connections to achieve chart success. And then Atlantic laid off Ron Poor as part of an industry-wide downsizing that the hit promo teams especially hard. Ron Poor says, quote, five years ago, ten years ago, it's radio, radio, radio. And now it's the last thing we do with these labels. End quote. Layoffs at Universal Music Group, Warner Music Group began in February. Dozens of employees, many in traditional media positions such as publicity, marketing, and radio. Same similar cuts have been affecting Sony Music Entertainment. So all these major radio publishers, record publishers, right? They're all dropping people from publicity, marketing, and radio. And then demanding more money from TikTok on royalties. Keep that in mind. Layoffs had little to do with the company's financial health. Universal earned $12 billion in revenue, $1.3 billion in net profit last year. Warner said it's coming off its best quarter ever. So they're making money. But they want to squeeze the TikToks of the world, the Spotify's and the Apple's and the Pandora's and all these others. They want to squeeze off of them. More money. In a February statement late, announcing layoffs, roughly two dozen staffers, Julie Greenwald, chairman CEO of Warner, owned Atlantic Music, said, quote, the changes we're making today were primarily happening in our radio and video teams. Just cutting them away. Lucian Grange, Universal Chairman and CEO, told staffers that before the latest layoffs, the label would be not just expanding ge- geographically and leveraging new technologies, but further evolve our organizational structure to create efficiencies in other areas of the business, end quote. Diane Monk Harrison, radio manager at Warner-owned distribution company WEA, WEA, Warner Electric Atlantic, lost her job in mid-March that the industry layoffs have been dis- disproportionately affecting radio promotion. The broadcast business is shrinking. The biggest radio companies, iHeartMedia, has been downsizing since the, the pandemic, including a recent wave in the last weeks. That means fewer programmers exist for major labels to lobby for extra playlist ads. Skip Bishop at Sony Music, a longtime promotion executive, says, oh, radio is still extremely important, but it's just an evolution. You don't need six regionals, three nationals, two VPs and an SVP at a label when 20 to 45 people are making decisions that 200 people used to make at radio. Another major label source talks to Bill Warner and says, quote, in the old world, you might have had radio promo people who were earning the same or more as a head of A&R. Now, that's not going to happen in the new world for obvious reasons. What's happening is the labels are keeping the absolute very best radio people. They spoke with Gordon Burrell, CEO of Burrell Associates, and mentioned that I don't think the record labels are daft of what has happened to the industry in terms of listeners. They're well aware of the aging nature of terrestrial radio programming iHeartMedia, $5.2 billion in debt, been laying off personnel over the last few years. Odyssey, filed for bankruptcy in January, owing $2 billion in debt. And as less radio employees, uh, as there are less radio employees, major legal staff who attempt to influence them have made proportionate changes. Dave Christie, veteran radio programmer, laid off from iHeartMedia Senior VP of Programming in Tulsa and Oklahoma City Clusters, says, quote, it makes sense to shrink your radio promotion when there's less radio people to deal with. I dealt with way more nationals in the fast, last few years from labels than what used to be called your regional guy. And I remember those days. You used to have some real cool people doing the regional side. I had Dave Craig was with Motown. Brett Al Perowitz was all universal. Dave Craig was uh, universal as well. I had some good people I got to work with on the regional side. And they will get you. We'll get you package. We'll get you out of package. We'll get you out new some music, and I'd play them like crazy. 
and I mean, it was fun doing that, but it's like, I always wanted to trust and give a chance to all music out there when I was a music director. And I loved it. I would give it a chance. An indie R&B and hip hop music executive says, quote, many artists are going around both labels and radio entirely. And I already have done the heavy lifting to break on TikTok and other social media. Quote, nobody, nothing will ever go back to the way it was just five years ago. A label may shift from promo field executives to mobile digital executives, just as radio is now relying on the digital radio estate to generate additional revenue. The radio business has shown resilience, they say. There's a chart metric study they had that shows that radio maintains a powerful ability to break hits. Stations aired 7.4 million songs, roughly 102.4 times a piece, 755 million spins. In 2023, and the top 10 radio songs earned major streaming boosts. Rock, pop, and hip-hop artists have become reliant on radio in recent years. Some genres, including Latin and country, remain attached to radio. Wendy Goldberg at iHeartMedia says, quote, music companies continue to be very strategic partners with the entire radio industry, and there's no signs that it is abating. Labels rely on broadcast radio to break new artists because in order to introduce new music to the masses, you need radio and its unparalleled reach. At many labels and artist management companies, radio and streaming teams are working in tandem, benefiting the hit-breaking relevance of both media. So they talked to Bob McLean of Crush Music, who manages Miley Cyrus, Green Day, Fall Out Boy, and Sia, and others, and says you could argue radio is not what it was 15 years ago. When you got a hit on radio, that was all being. Sometimes you used to lead with radio, and now radio comes later. Robust radio departments have been expensive for labels to maintain. Costing money to send employees from New York, L.A., or Nashville to build relationships with programmers throughout the U.S. Still, these departments are where labels keep boots on the ground. And it's just a shame to see all that's going on. It's a shame to see that radio is being so neglected. And by this happening, iHeartMedia, Odyssey, they understand they don't care about you anymore. You don't matter. You downsized, you micromanaged, you did so much shit wrong. As these other executives were saying in this Billboard article, they're bypassing you. You're considered useless, irrelevant. No matter how much you get help from putting music on the charts, the only thing that makes radio relevant still is that the algorithm for Billboard's charts still considers radio as such an important component. If Billboard chose to downsize the percentage of radio spins, then radio would be made irrelevant. Do you understand that? Now, I follow Talk of the Charts on Twitter. And Talk of the Charts always does a great job of showing you what music is coming out and what's Important to notice that's going up coming forward. Now, of the songs they have here, of uh, the every Billboard Hot 100 number one so far of 2024, 14 out of the 52 weeks of the year so far this year. So going up to April 6th, we're looking at the songs and how they performed and how much they were required streaming. So in here, they show the songs that required a lot of heavy uh, heavy airplay. Loving On Me, Jack Harlow, because of that, it was able to go and hold on to number one of the charts. What was it? Six different weeks? Non-consecutive? Meanwhile, Yes And, Ariana Grande song hit at number one. And only got 24.8 million stream or uh, uh, spins of airplay. But streaming made up for 27, 000, 27 million streams and 53,000 in sales. So sales and streaming really helped her out to get the number one. Megan Thee Stallion's Hiss. She had 104,000 in sales. 29 million in streams. Nothing from airplay. Texas Hold'em. Right now being number one. Or when it was number one. It didn't get any help from radio. When it became number one on March 2nd, it was 16 million airplay spins from radio. 
but sales was twenty eight thousand. Streams was twenty nine million. That's where it's got its. That's where it got its real numbers. Okay. And then the same thing happened for the following week, where radio Air, airplay went up about double from sixteen million to twenty seven million. Carnival hit number one, and it was just all mostly streaming. And no sales, no radio airplay. Got the number one. We Can't Be Friends got the number one. March 23rd, no airplay. 32 million streams, 9,000 sales. Lose Control, that got help from radio. 59 million streams, 59 million uh, plays in airplay. 23 million streams, but it had significantly pretty good streaming. And then right now, your number one song in the country like that Future Metric Boomin Kendrick Lamar. It's got nearly 60 million streams, 5 million in airplay, and 9,000 in sales. So radio is not necessary to become number one on the charts. And only a handful of artists that are high enough on the the chart there will get to that number one spot with or without radio. And I'm sure that all these record executives all realize, oh yeah, if we want to get their music up there, Texas Hold'em, a lot of very, very much a TikTok viral campaign to get her music up there. Even Jack Harlow had a little bit of that. Ariana Grande had that quite a bit. And actually, how much was hurt by Ariana Grande because it affected TikTok and not be able to have her song be placed up there? Because think about that. I mean, the moment Universal Music, I think, what is it? And I forget Teddy Swims is part of Universal Music uh, um, or Portfolio or the Umbrella. Ariana Grande is, but she got the song number one and it dropped right off. There's nothing more to help her out because radio is just caught in their place. Nothing much else you can do. How sad is that? Radio could absolutely be useful. It was local again. If you had music directors in place, if you had DJs in place, you had personalities in place, if you put the people in that are required to make a radio station hum, make a radio station operate and be a full 24 hour a day, seven day a week entertainment machine. There's no reason why it can't do that. There's no reason it can't do that. But, it was a mistake. It's a shame. So that's the idea. Oh, so radio is going to just, music labels are going to just use new technology to get their music out there. They're just going to forget all about radio. They don't care anymore. Speaking of debt laid in radio companies, Cumulus is trying to buy more time on its debt, give lenders more time and proposal. So they're trying to persuade debt holders to agree to a restructuring that would swap $346 million in loans in exchange for $800 for every thousand owed and a higher interest rate. You hear what they're saying? They want to swap their loans to get a higher interest rate and have a little more time on their credit. Cumulus has retired more than $130 million of debt since 2022. They want to move the maturity date on obligations from 2026 to 2029. They want three more years to pay it off. 2029 notes would have an 8.75% interest rate. Yeah, so put you back by three years and make the interest rate higher. Inside Radio reported last month that Cumulus is a long way from where it wants to be. The company said only $15 million of debt has been tendered so far. The figure has been unchanged since the company's last release. The last earnings call by Cumulus, their CFO, says they're reducing the total owed by more than $130 million and practically pushing the 2026 maturities back three years would enhance the long-term and financial flexibility. Right. Do you see how stupid that sounds? And radio is allowed to get away with it. How about that, huh? One more story I want to bring up before we wrap things up. And this is a, a more on the positive side. More people than ever are listening to podcasts. This is coming from Editor Research and being reported by Neiman Lab. 
the infinite dial service says that more Americans are listening to podcasts and listen to them regularly than ever. They surveyed almost 1,100 U.S. teens and adults for the report. 67% of the people in the U.S. age 12 and older have ever listened to a podcast. 47% in the last month. 34% in the last week. And they expect by 2024, altogether, an estimated 192 million people listen to podcasts. Out of what, 350 some odd people in the world, in the country? Pierre Bavard, Chief Insights Officer of Cumulus Media, argued that podcasts are no longer a niche platform lacking scale and says that podcasting deserves a larger role in media plans as opposed to test and learn experimental buys. Yeah, because if they want their podcast to make money, at least they want to be able to see if they can get money on their podcasts and not their radio shows. Right. Of course, they're, they're trying to think ahead, right? I also talk about the gaps under the other demographics. 59% of those under 35, 55% under those 54 listen to podcasts at least once per month. The gap between men and women has narrowed. 45% of women, 48% of men reported listening to a podcast in the past month. It's all very interesting and fascinating. You know, when I look at podcasting right now where it's at, I will admit I have not really been that caught up and listened to a lot of different podcasts out there because I've been so consumed with mine and just looking at what the audience looks like. It is one of those things where, I mean, I wish there was other places to get new music discovery and it would not be so controlled. And so the thing is to conclude my discussion tonight, I really wish there was some kind of understanding of coming to the table that corporate media, they need digital media. They need to embrace the digital disruption and not just try to make more money off of it. They, they need to realize that they need to go and create a new business model, a new mousetrap. If they want to be able to succeed, if they're content with a slow erosion of their revenue, the tactics like bullying TikTok to pay more royalties or bullying Meta and Google to a news bargaining media code and getting the government to go ahead and make them pay, it's not fair and it's not in good it's not in good it's not very polite. Because the establishment, the media establishment, thought they were always going to be established. They always thought, oh, they were going to always have control over all this. They were going to be the gatekeepers. The establishment. They're not anymore. They never planned for this. And over and over and over, from streaming to movies to music to radio to all of it, they continue to lose every step of the way. And because the name broadcaster means something more now than ever it does before. And they don't get that part. For myself, I was a big, huge news consumer. Not anymore. I mean, really, when I think about how much news I probably consume regularly, it's the accumulation, mostly of X. TikTok, Instagram, maybe. I mean, there's not much else. I mean, I feel like Facebook does a better job of being a local news source for all the groups that I'm in than I get from anywhere else. I get a lot of local news from Facebook because people are just kind of reporting on things. Restaurant reviews, their places to go, things to do, all that kind of stuff. Can't say the same for other things out there, but I don't know, man. I wish there was a better way, but there's not an answer out there. Well, all right. That's the show for tonight. I appreciate you always listening in this weekend. I get to go watch monkey man at the movie theater. I got WrestleMania to do this weekend. There's going to be a lot of stuff going on. Pretty busy. Monkey man looks fantastic. I can't wait to see it. And who knows, maybe I'll go and do a little review about it. But by the way, if you ever want to see reviews about what I think about some of the movies I watch, 
I have been putting out there over on Rotten Tomatoes. So if you look for King of Podcasts, under any movie out there, for the most part, you might see a review from yours truly in the uh, movie viewers column, right? Not the critics side, but the audience side. You might see an audience review from yours truly. So look out for those if you happen to see that. And we're going to leave it there. That's awesome. Another broadcaster's podcast, by the way, I've been doing some more podcasters row episodes. So I got a couple more episodes like that. I've been done. I hope you will check those out and see them for yourselves. They've been really enjoyable. So again, podcasters row, you can find that. My wrestling is real podcast where I'm doing all the wrestling media coverage. I'll be doing post shows for it. And of course the, the president of Bob's program, all at king of podcasts.com. So come back next week. And until then, remember that content is king and the control of your content is in your hands. Thank you.